Now we're going to pivot over and we're, we're going to look at sub, what's happening with housing, what's happening with spending. And these are some of those key things that I think the shift between the type of goods and the services, because I think this is an interesting shift that we're going to see over time where people are going to buy less stuff and more experiences and restaurants and things like that. So let's look at some of the, the, the shifts. So the, um, the breakdown of types of goods. So when we look at auto parts, when you look at the analysis below on the PC of consumer goods, so what are things being bought? Well, we have food and beverage down a bit. You have other durables, which is down, you know, when you look at the month over month, because I think month over month is obviously going to matter more than the year over year, given the base effect. So auto parts is going to continue to slow because autos and auto parts, we're starting to see those prices really push back and people saying now is not a good time to buy a car or buy a house, again, rejecting prices. But you're going to start to see some of those shifts where, well, let's look at services. So accommodations is up 8.4%, recreational 7%, food services 2.6%, transportation 2.4%. Every category in services is up month over month or at least flat. And that's where when you look at durable goods and types of goods, physical assets, most of them are down but one. So again, you're going to get this transition from goods to services. So that's where we keep talking about. You're not going to see a, a, an endless climb higher. It's you're going to get a pivot. You're going to get people buying less goods, people buying more services. And then when you look at just the consumer buying conditions on durable goods, houses, and vehicles, you can see that people view it very negatively. And it's just because of those price increases. People are, are saying, look, I'm going to wait and this is the, uh, the definition of the consumer rejecting price increases, which is going to cap some of those prices that we've seen in the durable side. But consumer spending tracker, consumers continue to spend. So you're still seeing people spend versus change from pre-COVID trend and over two years. Everything still remains elevated, which is good. But again, we, it, it, you get this nice little, little, this little bump up with that um, uh some of those uh, benefits, but now you're going to start to see that slow down a bit. And coming back to my favorite chart, the change in wealth by income quintile, U.S. households added $13.5 trillion in wealth last year, largest increase going back three decades, yet over 70% of increase went to the top 20% of income earners, one third of that went to the top 1%. So even though we're seeing people spend it's going to be, okay, well, I know that there's elevated savings, but where are they going into? Who is actually saving? And where is that money going to go? And a lot of these individuals don't have any need to spend from savings because they, they're going to squirrel it away. Maybe they're investing in something and they don't need to put it back into the market. So they can, again, how quickly this gets unleashed into the market in this rapid spending, I think is where I disagree with some of the market views that all of the savings is just going to get dumped into the market, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that is, is the short answer. So then when you look at durable goods, so slightly weaker than expected, came in at 2.3% versus 2.8 on the estimate, a negative 0.8% in prior month, uh, revised up from negative 0.3%, orders uh, uh, X transports, which is that orange line, is positive 0.3 uh, versus 0.7% estimate. And then 1.7% in prior month revised up from 1%. So you're seeing that the, the, the goods, new orders industry. So again, you're starting to see some of that, you know, not a huge change, still positive. You're still seeing some of that positive move. There's a, some seasonality in that for May in terms of durable goods. We expect to see a little bit of a slowdown in, in June, but still at, at a positive move. You're starting to see some of that positivity. And then you're, but at the same time, U.S. durable goods orders X transportations in monetary value is at all time highs. So this is showing that price increase because on a dollar value, everything just costs more. So even though people are still that again, this is where people are starting to view this as a poor time to buy given these price increases and they would rather wait than trying to go out there and spend and compete. And now let's look at durable good orders. So when we look at the orders, you know, transportation is uh, changes from uh, since February. When you look at just May, you can see just where some of the strength is in terms of total change since Feb. 
Transportation is down 3.5%. Uh, Computers is up 8.8%. Total orders is 9.7%. So while computers and electronics is the one that had this big spike, and we think some of this is going to, to roll back. But when you look at May, you can see that you know computers are starting to slow, which is what we think is going to continue to happen. Total orders still up, up 2.3%. But when then you look at uh, fabricated metals, you're starting to look at some of these things are going to come under pressure over the coming few months, just given a lot of these price increases, which is going to slow down some of these orders. But then you go to the other side and you say, okay, well, supply chains are, are delayed. You know, it's taking longer and longer to receive stuff. So I'll put in the order now with the idea that I'm not going to get it for a long period of time. So, but you're, uh, then if you, when we went through the breakdown of the PMIs, you're starting to see a pause in new orders. So I think you're starting to see that hit, which is going to reverberate in June. Now, when we look at homes and you look at the, the shift in real estate. So in 2020, the millennial share of household wealth remains in incredibly low. So in 2020, many millennials are in their early 30s and they own just 3% of all household wealth. So this is where we still haven't seen this catch up. And, it, and just if you look at just prices right now, it's near impossible to catch up without having this huge down payment or taking a much bigger mortgage, which has been done when you look at the amount of jumbo mortgages that have get, been put into the market. But this is some of those overhang that we continue to see on how the, you know, the millennial side and the younger generation is being left behind because they're being priced out of this, this essentially the, the household market and owning a home and, and increasing equity and, and being able to leverage up. And then the lower end home is getting gutted or knocked down. And then the, it's being, uh, you know, this huge thing is being built at triple the price. So you don't even have the quote unquote starter home to really get, to really get started in to build that equity. Instead, you have to you know, enter at the highest level. But with rent going up, it becomes harder to save for the down payment, which again creates this, in, this, this backdrop and shortage of baby boomers selling and millennials able to buy because there's that huge disconnect in between the two. Now, one can come up, but also one needs to come down. And if you look at wages, you know, which has been stagnant over the last, you know, 20 years, as we talked about two weeks ago, the 1989, 2009, and then 2021, uh, 2020, you can see just the, the amount of wealth out there just isn't there at the same time, at the same way, which again is leading to some of these issues that will continue to be problematic. And fewer U.S. millennials own homes than previous generations at the same age, where millennials in 2016 owned about 24, uh, you know, 23%, where when you look at uh, baby boomers, and again, it's pricing. Now, some of these individuals, millennials in particular, wanted to live urban. So this number will see a gap close post when it's updated for post-COVID, because some of them are wealthy and moved out of the home and, and wanted to capitalize. But that's also a certain amount of Gen X is in that because Gen X also had an urban setting. So there's going to be a mixture where both of those will go higher. But again, millennials not making up ground. And new home sales are starting to come back down to the trend. And it comes down to pricing. And, and you're starting to see more individuals reject those price increases, which is leading to some of that cooling that we've talked about in new home sales. So what when you look at the MBA, so applications continuing to fall per index now at the lowest since, 2000, uh, since uh, Jan 2020. So again, you're starting to see everyone's taking a little bit of a breath saying, look, we don't need to wait. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait a bit. We don't need to rush out there and try to capitalize. And that's when you're starting to see U.S. new one family houses, months of supply. The supply is starting to increase. So as the supply increases, you should start to see some of that pricing moderate in the sense of, you know, you're not going <laughs> to... You're not going to offer asking, or you're not going to offer a hundred thousand over asking. You're going to offer asking or ten thousand above or twenty thousand above, depending on your market. Some places are still red hot, 
but you're starting to see that kind of crossover between 2021 and 2020. And that's going to be something to watch as we start to see some of this new supply coming into the market. Then it was looking at U.S. homes for sale and home prices. So existing homes for sale, you can see that bounce off the bottom, but home prices continue to shift higher. So home prices just crushed records in April. Home price index up 15.7% year over year, a record. The S&P Case-Shiller National uh, home price 14.6% year over year, a record. The surge in home prices is dampening demand as some buyers get priced out which is why there's going to be some adjustment in some of those different uh, capacity. And this just puts it a little bit differently. So you can see it on the backdrop on that steady increase that really kicked off in June of 2020. And you, we haven't seen much of a turn back. And this is looking at month over month as well as year over year. Because month over month, you're continuing to see this, tr this, this essentially pulled higher and when we look at this versus rent in the next uh, few slides, you'll see just just that that how high that has really gotten. And then when uh, when you compare it, uh, going back to historics, the new record S and P Core Logic K Shiller index at fourteen point six percent year over year in April, thirteen point three percent in prior month. Growth rate barely eclipsed the prior high of fourteen point five percent in September of two thousand five. So we're back to the peak that we hit in September of 2005, and we all know what happened after that. So then when we look at purchase only uh, housing price index, so when we look at the purchase price and the average hourly earnings, you can see the gap continues to wide. Coming back to if you don't have a home to sell to buy the next one, then you're missing that gap. You have to make up that gap either in the down payment or the mortgage. Again, increasing prices and increasing the debt load on those that don't have that home. Again, which is why the millennial not having a home to sell and being a first time home buyer is left in terms of making up that breakdown. But this is also looking at we still haven't seen the Case Shiller house price, uh, the CPI owner's equivalent, and CPI primary rent. We have just barely started to see that get priced into CPI. Again, the driving force of why we're not going to see this drop in CPI, we're going to continue to see the steady grind higher as these continue to get pushed and factored into those underlying costs. But where are some of these things being held? Well, <laughs> I just, I, I laugh at because, and, and, I, and I laugh just because I said that the reverse repo was going to hit $1 trillion for quarter end. Instead, it came in at $991 billion. So I was close. And, and if, we, if we want to go based on uh, Price is Right uh, rules, I'm, I'm close to the pin, and I'll take that as a win. But obviously, banks have more than enough liquidity. So all banks exceed Fed's key capital ratio of 4.5%. They blew through it easily. So now all of them can start buybacks, can start all these different things. And again, we're, we're, you know, the liquidity side is saturated, which is why we start talking about you know, tapering of QE and what does QE look like? What, is, what do rates look like? Because at the same time, the contribution of physical, pol fiscal policy to real GDP growth goes negative because you have a surge and then everybody buys what they can or what they want and then it goes back down and you're starting to see that and the negative impacts are only going to increase through 2022, not just on a base effect level, but because you, the government transfers have happened, now that they've happened, they're not happening again, hopefully, and people then pull back on spending because they're not going to spend what they don't have and they already used the money that was, that was made available. So then when you look at, well, what's going to happen for treasury issuance, you can see the extensive shortfall where the, the projected available cash balance, which is where we're looking at that we're going to hit that debt ceiling again, where the treasury is going to run out of money and they're going to have to borrow more to raise that. So we're going to have to see that debt limit rise again, which is just funny that we still have it because it's just a joke at this point. But when we look at home prices, so you have banks that are stuffed with liquidity. You have you know QE that's continuous, and it's continuous with the Federal Reserve constantly buying MBS uh, securities. So when you look at the market, so the market value is at uh, uh, about seven trillion. So let's just call it seven trillion. So we're at seven point oh eight trillion in the in the uh, market value. 
2.34 trillion is value is owned by the Federal Reserve or 33%. Essentially, all new MBS that has been issued have been bought by the Fed. So this is also driving up prices because what does a bank care if they if if they sell a bad mortgage because then they'll just package it, it goes into an MBS and the Fed will buy it. So again, there's a lot of risk in the market, especially on the housing side. Now let's look at those those government transfers. So d- despite direct fiscal aid waning, government transfer payments still account for 20% of personal income. This is going to continue to abate as those excess um, uh, um, unemployment uh, checks start to expire. This will continue to pull back, again, decreasing some of that spending. Now, the there was also a decline in savings rates in May to 12.4% versus 14.5% in the prior month, still well above pre-pandemic levels and the recent peak of 12% in 12 in 2012. But remember, who has that savings? And it's not the people that need that savings the most, again, leading to some of those underlying problems. So then when you look at real disposable personal income, the government transfers is what's making that delta, which are, ex- are going to go away with those unemployment benefits expiring. So when we look at that personal income backdrop, you can see personal income month over month continuing to start to normalize. You know, expenditures are, are, are essentially flattish with the U- personal consumption expenditures chain from $2012 down 0.4%. So again, you're starting to see that normalization thing starting to roll over a bit. And that'll only accelerate as government transfers continue to pull back. Then when we look at that consumption side, you still see the consumption remaining elevated uh, month over month. It's just, it's changing and flipping from, again, goods into services. And as services are going to get more expensive, they're not as expensive as the goods side. So you'll start to see that on a nominal level really start to pull back. And then the personal income dynamics, this is the transfers that we're talking about. These transfers are going to go away or at least come to a negligible level and you're going to have to see the unemployment benefits. That's also going to start to go away. So compensation is going to have to become a much bigger part to bridge that gap. And based on wages and unwillingness to hire right now, that's an unlikely means of seeing that huge increase. And that's when we start looking at the consumer spending rotation. This is that durable goods falling, services increasing, and we're starting to see some of those differences come through. And that's some of those pivot points that we keep talking about and we keep highlighting because, again, jobs is going to matter significantly because it's going to drive so much, which is why we had said employment was going to go from a lagging indicator to a leading indicator because as employment picks up, you're going to have to see some of these adjustments and we're just not seeing them yet because there's still government transfers, but the savings is so lopsided that when people talk about the gross number and not the net impact, they're missing a large part of the underlying story, which is what we keep trying to highlight too. So now in the next segment, we're going to pivot abroad and really start looking at Europe and what are some of the things happening within the European Union and just the European continent in general.